Hello and welcome to the Beyond Six Seconds podcast. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel, and on today's episode, I'm speaking with Marissa Hamamoto, the first professional dancer to be named People Magazine Women Changing the World. Marissa is a stroke survivor with two invisible disabilities, PTSD and autism. She's the founder of Infinite Flow, an award-winning nonprofit and professional dance company that employs disabled and non-disabled artists with a mission to foster inclusion. Marissa is a speaker, thought leader, performing artist, and multi-dimensional creator on the rise, seeking to creatively inspire inclusion, innovation, and transformation through movement, dance, and storytelling. Marissa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about your story, which is incredibly amazing in itself, all the things that you've you've come through and gone through to build this amazing dance company that really highlights the art and creativity and possibilities of all kinds of people. You've been a dancer since a very early age. Tell me about your story. What was your experience like as a young dancer? Absolutely. So quick visual description of myself. So I am a Japanese American woman with long black hair. Today I am wearing a, a pink and red and black kind of blouse. And I have a pretty blank background today. So um, thank you so much again, Carolyn, for having me on the show. So uh, about my dancing, I've been dancing my whole life, just just in, in a short nutshell. But how I got into dance was uh, I grew up in Irvine, California during the 80s and 90s. And for anyone that doesn't know where Irvine is, Irvine is, is a suburb of Los Angeles. So it's about 50 miles south of LA. Irvine back in the 80s and 90s was a predominantly white city and my family being Japanese American we were a minority at school I got picked on for looking different but the highlight of my week was this once a week ballet class after school where I found myself as the only person of color in class but something about moving my body to music with the other girls made me feel like I belonged and so from just a very early age of like six and seven, I may have not been able to articulate this in words, but I had discovered the power of dance to unite people together. Dancing quickly became a passion of mine. I, I was someone that was quite shy. I didn't like to speak, which is very interesting because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a professional speaker today, <laughs> but Anyways, I didn't like to speak, so dancing kind of gave me this outlet to express myself, and it was comfortable. Something about the dancing made me feel like I belonged, so it just quickly became my passion. So when I was 12, I saw this beautiful performance of the New York City Ballet at the local theater, and it was just so beautiful. I was just so mesmerized by the beauty, and I just could not help help but think wow, that's what I want to become when I grow up. I want to become a professional ballerina. So I had made up my mind by the end of New York City Ballet Sleeping Beauty that I was going to one day become a professional ballerina, but I really didn't know what I was getting into. And so for the next, for my entire teenage years, I lived in, in this duality where I knew in my gut that dance belonged to everyone, yet the dance industry, the world of ballet made it only seem like dance was only accessible and available to a select few with a certain body type, with a certain capacity to move your limbs. And so this duality was really frustrating. You know, I was told over and over that my body wasn't right for dance. You're too big, you're too curvy. You don't have the right feet. You're not flexible enough. I mean, the list goes on and on. And, you know, and I've even gotten that, well, you know, let's put you at the end of the line because you're a little darker than everyone. I was in this duality, but it, in in my gut, there was always a part of me that said, I am born to be a dancer and dance is for everybody. But, you know, kind of not not knowing that there are other paths outside of becoming a professional ballerina with the American Ballet Theater, 
which, you know, I kind of got sucked into that world, believing that that was the only path of success as a dancer. It was a very frustrating time, I would say. Now, there is one thing that I know that we're going to talk about Infinite Flow, my dance company at some point here, but there is one moment during my high school years that defined my life or defined what I do today. And I didn't even know that till very recently, actually, when I realized, wow, that would, that that moment was pretty profound. And just to kind of explain, so, you know, at 12, made a decision to become a ballerina, kept on hitting walls. Ballet was supposed to be this time outside of school that gave me a lot of joy, but it was very, you know, it was a very hard time to be rejected and constantly being told that you're not good enough. I was going to graduate high school early. At the end of junior high school year, I had enough credits to graduate. However, my parents insisted that I graduate from a quote unquote real high school with real people around me. And it's sorry, I skipped a whole section, but I homeschooled. And we'll get into the whole homeschool thing because that's actually related to my autism. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, we did some research and we found a performing arts high school two hours away from Los Angeles by the name of Idlewild Arts Academy. It was a private boarding school, a perf- an art school, and I was able to get a scholarship to this school. And otherwise, I don't think we would have been able to afford this school. But anyways, this school was known not only for its really awesome academics and arts education, but it was also known for its diversity and inclusion. Gay kids got to be gay. And I think 15 to 20 percent of the student body were international students. So just naturally, multiculturalism was really celebrated on campus. And this was the first year, I think, in my schooling where I really felt like I belonged. And I had a really great year. Dorm life was fun and I made friendships and it was just a place where I I felt like I was able to be myself. And so I just, you know, being in the state of gratitude that I, you know, thank you to my parents to just kind of pushing me to kind of do some research and find a school that where I can belong, you know, year went great. At the end of the school year, the final dance concert was a student choreographed concert. And there was 36 students in the dance department, 12 seniors, and the 12 seniors, including myself, we had an opportunity to choreograph a work in this show. We were assigned to pick the cast, pick the music, and turn that into the office. That's what we did. A couple days later, I decided to sneak into the dance studio a little earlier than everyone because I just wanted to see which of my friends and my classmates had selected me into their work. So I enter this dim dance studio with a heavy backpack on my back and walking towards the department bulletin board. And I stand there and I look up and down the piece, the three sheets of paper. And I notice that my name is missing, that I don't find my name anywhere except for my own work as a choreographer. And I look up and down again, and my name is still not there. And, you know, I started to cry. It's one thing to be rejected by authority and institutions. It's another thing to be rejected by your own peers. And so the fact that my own classmates and friends or people that I thought were my friends didn't select me was really hurtful. And we're approaching the end of senior year and it just felt like I felt like I was I was betrayed like you know I was betrayed by this plan that was that was where I was supposed to graduate high school in this inclusive environment and here I am excluded all over but then when I looked up and down the three sheets of paper for a third time I noticed something else and that something else was that seven other students mostly in the lower grades were also not included in the cast. And I was like, hmm, this doesn't seem right. I mean, this is Idlewild Arts Academy. It's known for its diversity and inclusion. And oh my gosh, this is a student choreography concert. 
that everybody should be able to participate in this. This isn't some professional major production, you know, come on, let's, this is a student, student, you know, dance concert. Everyone should have the opportunity to learn and experience, you know, experience this. And those feelings of injustice and wrong were just so strong in me that in that moment, I took out a pencil out of my backpack and wrote down all seven names into my own cast. And honestly, I barely knew these seven dancers, seven younger dancers. Yet by the time Showtime came around, you know, I knew them well. And I'll say that a few of them are Facebook friends of mine today. And, you know, we had a blast. And even though I was definitely very new at choreographing, I, I can definitely confirm that I did my best to really utilize each of their unique talents into whatever I created. <laughs> and one day, maybe I can find that video. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that year, I was named Dance Major of the Year at commencement. But the bigger win was this, that since I graduated high school in the year of 2000, there was a policy placed in the dance department that ensured that all students, all dance students participated in the student choreography concert. And here we are 20 plus years later and that policy is still there. And so that's when I realized that, wow, my small actions can lead to big change. And that was also the moment that I took myself out of the seat of the victim and put myself into the driver's seat. That, you know, when we come across kind of challenges, you know, we can ask ourselves, well, who else is left out? What can I do? And how can I serve? And I didn't know it at that time, but taking out this pencil and writing down seven names basically has impacted what I do today. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times when we see injustice, we wonder, like, well, what could I possibly do about it? It's such a large, big problem. But as mm -hmm. your story demonstrates, it can be, you can start with yourself and you can start small and you can start including people in your own life and your work and your actions have had a lasting impact, certainly on those students and also on the school. And I can definitely see the sort of the, the start of infinite flow and the ultimate inclusion of that and uh, making art where everyone can participate, every kind of dancer and artist. After high school, you continued to dance, and I know you had some very challenging situations and, and obstacles that you faced from there. So yeah, tell me about after you graduated and what your uh, dancing career and activities looked like then. Yeah, so after high school, after a big argument with my father, I actually chose initially not to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and decided to pursue what was in my heart, which at that time was becoming a professional ballerina. However, that didn't fly. And after a couple of years and also getting injured, having a back injury, I I quickly, well, not quickly, but I will say, you know, after a couple of years, I said, you know what? I think all these teachers that have been telling me for years that I'm just not made for this are right, you know? And so let's just say I was spiritually pretty torn apart as well. So I literally quit dancing. I remember I was in New York City, giving myself one last chance to audition for stuff. But I remember, you know, that day where I literally took my dance shoes, my dance clothes, and put them into the dumpster saying, I'm done, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't think I've ever said that. I, I, I ever told that actually on a podcast before, but it was... A, but yeah, I, that was like the way that I quit. Anyways, after that, you know, I, I moved back home with my parents for a moment to kind of think through what I wanted to do next. Then uh, more than what I wanted to do next, I knew that I that the the obvious path, you know, especially coming from an Asian family, was to go to college. And so my parents were like, okay, well, you know let's, let's do college. And so I had to reapply to a bunch of colleges, but there was a part of me that just was feeling really uneasy. You know, I was always like this student that was ahead of everyone. Mm -hmm. And then here I am, I'm three years behind my own class. And I was just feeling really like, 
I, I was feeling a little bit like a, a failure altogether. And I, I just knew that I needed to change, like to have a drastic change if I was going to do the college thing. So long story short, after some conversations with my parents, we decided that I would go to school in Japan. And, you know, being fourth generation Japanese American, born between a third generation Japanese American father and a mother directly from Japan. You know, I did grow up bilingual and bicultural, which is well, maybe not the bicultural part is kind of unusual for a fourth generation Japanese American person. I mean, language is usually lost from the third generation, I would say. So I was fluent, but I really didn't know my own culture. So I felt like, well, this is a great time for me to, you know, live in, in the country of my blood. And so I ended up at Keio University in, in Tokyo. And Keio was kind of like in Harvard, Ivy League-ish school. I would say in Japan, it's very academic. It's kind of got that Ivy vibe. And so I didn't go to school for the arts at all. But there was a part of me that wanted to continue working in dance in some capacity. So initially, initially when I entered university, I had this vision of becoming a doctor for dancers. And I got myself into sports biomechanics. I was just interested in learning about the human body altogether. But once I got into sports biomechanics and got into the sports sciences, I started to kind of wonder, well, maybe if I studied this stuff really well, I can actually become a better dancer, <laughs> you know? So there is that part. And then the other part was that I <laughs> was having a really hard time fitting in in Japan. You know, it's very interesting because 99% of people in Japan are Japanese. They look, quote unquote, look like me. Yet I go to this country and I still feel like I don't fit in. And some of this just had to do with the fact that I grew up in the state. So therefore, you know, I might look like everyone, but I'm not like everyone, you know. And so where I actually found belonging and peace all over was dance. So I started taking dance class outside of campus. I started occasionally participating in different shows and you know, started freelancing around as a dancer. And that's where I was starting to find connection and belonging all over. And the dance bug hit me all over. Like, And I think by the time junior year came around, I was like, you know, when I graduate college, I'm going to pursue this dance dream all over again. So between junior and senior year, I started to, you know, in addition to school, working part-time as a English teacher and also as a Japanese English translator and interpreter, I was dancing, I was training. And I, where I was heading was, okay, after I graduate, I'm going to go to Europe and do the whole audition thing. Senior year I came around and I was feeling pretty good for the fact that I had a close to 4.0 GPA, despite doing school and <laughs> in a language that's not quite my my strong language, Japanese. And, you know, and I was dancing quite a bit. Part-time work was okay. And I, I was feeling like I, I had actually, I was feeling like I had my shit together <laughs> in many ways. But one day, July 26, 2006, I was taking a contemporary dance class late at night in the middle of Tokyo. And it was just one of those days where like my body felt good. Like I, my body was flying through space. It was just one of those good dance days that was where, you know, you don't really have many of those good dance days. But in the middle of that, I felt my elbows tingle and then momentarily fell to the ground. I couldn't move my arms I couldn't move my legs and I found myself completely paralyzed from the neck down. I remember someone came over and lifted my arm, yet I couldn't feel her hand on my arm. I was carried to the hospital and a couple of days later, I was diagnosed with something called spinal cord infarction, also known as spinal stroke, and was told by the doctor that I may never be able to walk or dance again. That had to be such just a, a terrifying experience, you know, just having this come out of nowhere. And then, of course, you're not in your home country. So you're away from home and you're in the hospital and you're getting this news. 
but somehow you recovered, which, which, which like physically, which is incredible. So, but what was it like in in the hospital, and how did you recover from that? Yeah, I mean, the long story short is, you know, two months later, I did walk out of the hospital, and today, I do have a left hand that's slightly slightly paralyzed, still paralyzed, partially paralyzed. I have a left side, like my left side of my torso is numb. And today it's a little bit number than other days. But besides that, I do not consider myself physically disabled. During the two months in the hospital, to be very, to be very honest with you, it's kind of a blur right now. Like, but I'll just say that, you know, at the acute stage, you know, I really couldn't move anything the neck down I couldn't feel anything from the neck down <clears throat> my organs were quote-unquote paralyzed for example it's like it's like my brain would say I want to go pee <laughs> and I couldn't get to the bathroom on my own and so you know in the hospital bed I was in on the right side of my head was something called a nurse call button so I would bonk the button with my head to call the nurse the nurse would hoist me out of the bed, put me in a wheelchair, wheel me 10 feet to the bathroom, lift me up, put me on the toilet, put my pants down. I mean, that was that was the drill. Uh, so in Japan, Japan's got these fancy toilets, fancy like bidet toilets. And a lot of stalls have these fancy bidets. And with the bidet comes this little kind of device on the wall where you can press these buttons for water and for to dry and all this stuff and so anyways on this device was a clock and so on the clock I can check what time I sat down onto that toilet and I can tell when what time I leave anyways so I'm sitting on the toilet nurse has gone out of the side of the bathroom and I would sit there forever and nothing would come out. But after some time, something would come out. And at first it was frustrating, but then I noticed that every day the time to go pee became a little shorter each day. So I think the first time I timed myself, I think it was like 32 minutes or something. But a couple of days later, it was at 30. And I realized, oh, okay, perhaps my body is just slow <laughs> and this is just a matter of just time and I can either look at the situation as bad or I can think of this as progress and so I'll say that that was the you know seeing that the time was getting shorter and shorter was encouraging but anyways so in my case I, I do think that my recovery is maybe unusual how much I did. And I don't know why, like when people ask me, so how did you recover so much? And I said, I don't know, you know, maybe it was the grace of nature. But what I will also say is that once I was able to take a couple steps, which was about three and a half weeks or so, they sent me to physical therapy and occupational therapy, you know, which was still in the same hospital. And I would, you know, be given a list of exercises on a sheet of paper to do for physical therapy. And then, you know, same thing with occupational therapy. And I remember like with the, on the physical therapy sheet, like there was an exercise, for example, that said, lift your knee 10 times. And I'll be like, well, how do we lift that knee? And then what rhythm is it turned out, turned in, how high? You know, and as a dancer, it's like, you know, you're not just going to lift your knee 10 times. It's like the intention behind that knee, you know, that you lift. So what ended up happening was instead of spending just an hour in that physical therapy and occupational therapy room, I would spend three, four hours in there. And this is before iPhones. So I didn't really have a device to really play music. So I would imagine music in my head and I would literally do these exercises you know, with music in mind, but then I would also incorporate like all the rhythmical 
technical things I learned in dance and also like, you know, putting intention into the movement. So if there is anything I did at that time that might be a little different from the average patient out there, it's that. But I, I don't have any like scientific evidence saying that that is the reason why I was able to physically recover. However, I will say more than the physical recovery, the emotional, psychological, mental recovery was a lot bigger for me. The doctor said, well, you know, this may or may not happen again. Who knows? And so when you're kind of put into that place of being in limbo, <laughs> it's like, well, like what? I might have to go through this whole paralysis again. Mm -hmm. And so even though I left the hospital feeling a little bit on a high, on the flip end, I was in the state of fear. And I'll say that the state of fear kind of blew up a lot bigger than the state of feeling like everything is okay. The thing about the stroke is that the stroke triggered a lot of other trauma from my life. And that a lot of that trauma was actually connected directly to dance, all the rejection that I had endured. But also, I think the biggest thing that I was triggered by was when I was 19 years old, I was raped by one of my ballet teachers who also didn't believe in me. And the stroke felt like a curse from this person. Like, hey, you know, I told you, you're not made to be a dancer. So you shouldn't be dancing. So I'm just going to curse you with the strokes. And obviously at this time of being, you know, being unable to move my arms and my legs, I didn't think that it was possible to dance. But anyways, um, the trauma from that was just very big. Yet, you know, the idea or the concept of mental health and therapy was definitely not in my vocabulary at that time, nor my family's and nor my, maybe maybe my culture of like, oh, okay, you know, you're, you're, you're physically recovered from the stroke, but how are you really feeling? Like, <laughs> you know, the physical recovery doesn't necessarily equal recovery as a whole. So I spent about three, four years, like really just living in a lot of fear a lot of social isolation. I was scared to do things because I would be like, well, if I if I try this, what if I get a stroke? And I was honestly very scared to go back to dancing too, because there's a part of me that was like, well, what if I have a stroke inside of that dance class? And also it's it's like, well, what's the point of dancing? Because you know, it seems like nobody likes me as a dancer and nobody wants me as a dancer and I'm just not talented enough and not good enough and all this stuff. Thankfully, at the end of this dark tunnel, I discovered ballroom dancing and salsa dancing. And how this happened was at, let's see, December 2010, I just happened to be at a business holiday party in Tokyo. And in the middle of this party was a salsa performance. A dance couple came out, performed, and after they performed, they got everybody else onto the dance floor. And there's about a hundred Japanese people attending this, mostly in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. I was in my 20s at that time, so I was on the younger side. And let me just say, you know, Japanese people <laughs> are not very much the type <laughs> that goes out and busts the move on the dance floor. We're, we're quite reserved. <laughs> However, in this party and in this moment, I have never seen so many Japanese people just light up doing a simple salsa step. That's just six steps forward and backwards. And, you know, I was kind of amongst the crowd you know, stepping the salsa basic step. And I'm looking around going, wow, everybody is dancing. And so am I. So am I. And, you know, that was when, like, I was brought back into my body. Like, it was just so much fun to move. And that the joy of dance kind of came back into me for the first time since the stroke. And to be very honest with you, during the three, four years of just living in fear, you know, I started to wonder if I mattered in the world. Like if I went today, would anybody really even care? 
But during this time of, you know, stepping the salsa basic step and just really reconnecting with my body and moving my body with joy, I realized that I mattered, you know, and what, what I like to say today is that, you know, our body language not only speaks to others, but speaks to ourselves as well. So moving your body with joy, that joy will return to you. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's amazing that, and just so fortuitous that you were exposed to a different type of dancing that I guess was, was different enough from what you had done, but still you found that joy. Finding your passion and your joy and reconnecting, it sounded like, really helped you get back on the track of the things that you cared about. And as you said, really reminded you and, and solidified that you you matter as a, a dancer and, and a person. Mm -hmm. At some point on that journey, you also discovered or learned about wheelchair dancing. And that was sort of the very beginning spark of infinite flow. And I mention this because I, I know when I think of wheelchair dancing, maybe many other people tend to think of it as like in a rehabilitation center or with like elderly people or like, you know, sort of just more like a rehab function, but not necessarily as a, a performance art. So I would love to know how you sort of learned about wheelchair dancing as a performance art and how that kind of sparked from an interest to sparking this passion to start Infinite Flow. Yeah, absolutely. So I became a certified ballroom dance instructor in early 2011. Um, and so that kind of launched me into or let's just say that was like the restart of rebuilding my dance career. And I ended up in Los Angeles in 2012, you know, to give myself a second chance to this dream dance career, dream entertainment career now. Yet I started to hit a lot of walls again. And those walls were very similar to what I had experienced as a teenage ballerina. Hey, Marissa, you just don't have the look of the commercial dancer you're Asian American and we don't want to see Asian American ballroom and salsa dancers on TV and film. And so I was, I was starting to hit the same exact walls of my body, not fitting the, whatever people were looking for. And again, my gut kept on saying, well, isn't, you know, dance a universal language that belongs to everybody, you know? And so there's, again, living, I'm just hitting the, you know, living again in this duality of dance being a universal language that belongs to everybody, yet here's the dance industry or Hollywood say, no, it's only accessible to a select few. But this time, things were a little different. Somehow, I started to really believe that it wasn't my body or my ethnicity that was wrong. You know, the problem was the systemic biases the discrimination, the stereotypes that exist in our society. And there's a part of me that was really feeling like I wanted to do something to change that. And I didn't know what. But one day when I was meditating, I remember taking out that pencil when I was in high school. And I said, I asked myself, well, who else is left out? What can I do? How can I serve? And long story short, that led me on this long Google search of learning about disability and the statistics behind, behind you know, disabled people and learning that, you know, one in four Americans, 61 million Americans have a disability. 15% of the world, the global population, which is about 1 billion people have a disability. Yet, how often do we hear about disability in dance? And so, just knowing that dance wasn't equally accessible to disabled people, I felt a calling to do something about this. So in a, in a metaphorical way, I took out the pencil again. And, and this time I'm like, okay, this will be for the 1 billion disabled people in the world. And, you know, I mean, these statistics, sometimes I hear 1 billion, I, I hear 1.7 billion. Either way, it's a lot of people in the, in lots of disabled people in the world, a lot more than we think. I didn't know where to start, but I just asked the universe, okay, I feel called to create more access in dance shoot me the opportunities that will get me there. 
And so one thing kind of led to the next. And one of the things I did was, you know, as a ballroom dancer, we're always on the search for a dance partner or dance partners. And this might be for competition, for teaching, for shows, for an audition. Like we're always on the search for dance partners. And I said, well, why don't I find myself a wheelchair dance partner? And, you know, the idea of being able to dance without the use of your limbs just fascinated me as a stroke survivor. I looked around and I couldn't find any wheelchair dancers. And so then I went on a search to find a wheelchair athlete or actor. And that was when I came across Adelpho, a paraplegic athlete, a paraplegic bodybuilder that lived about 30 miles away from me. And then I stalked him on social media for a few days. <laughs> And then I saw this YouTube video of him posing for like a bodybuilding competition with a really big smile. And, you know, Delfo's, Delfo's Filipino American. He's got this long, black, gorgeous hair. <laughs> and, you know, he's playing with his hair as he's like doing all these poses. And, and as I saw him just, just pose, I'm like, you know what? I can turn him into a dancer. So I literally messaged him on Facebook saying, hey, my name is Marissa. I'm a stroke survivor. I'm just exploring this, this idea around wheelchair dance, blah, 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 blah. Would you like to meet with me and try dancing? And to my surprise, and about an hour later, he said yes. <laughs> and so not knowing each other at all, we got into the dance studio a couple of days later. And honestly, I was terrified to initially dance with him. There was all these thoughts around, well, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I getting myself into? Will I hurt him? All these thoughts like were going through my head. But after a couple hours of just kind of experimentally partnering with him, and, I, and, and also he had zero formal dance training either. He didn't know how to count the music. Um, after a couple hours, there was this magical moment where I realized that dancing with Adelpho was nothing different from dancing with anyone else. And that was where I realized, wow, you know, dance doesn't discriminate. And when you're dancing with someone, you see beyond race, color, size, age, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. And that night, all I can think of was, wow, if the world danced, there would be no war. I have to share this experience of dance, like uh, of being able to find connection through dance that transcends words, that transcends culture, that transcends any label or identity you can think of. I got to share this with the world. And that eventually became Infinite Flow in 2015. And Infinite Flow did start off as a wheelchair ballroom dance company. You know, my process kind of as a business person was, let's go super, super niche. However, Infinite Flow today, you know, yes, it is. We are a professional dance company that employs disabled and non-disabled dancers with diverse intersectional identities. In terms of the disability part, it's not just wheelchair dancers. We do have we have dancers with physical disabilities, deaf, blind, neurodiversity, intellectual disabilities, chronic illnesses. Basically, we're sending out a message here that we can all unite through dance. My vision with Infinite Flow is massive. You know, it's not just making dance accessible, but it's like using dance as a catalyst to make systemic change. And to be very honest with you, my goal with Infinite Flow is that is that we don't have to exist anymore because we have created change in the systems that, you know, the existing system is inclusive and it's accessible. However, yeah, building an organization is definitely not easy, <laughs> but I always kind of return back to the concept of that's, you know, our small actions can lead to big change. And so recently I actually rewrote our mission to, to read, to create a more inclusive world, one dance at a time. So the impact of one dance, one interaction, one connection can ripple into the world in ways that we don't even know. So even though we're a small organization still, 
my intention is that, you know, our small actions do lead to big change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I'll include some links in the show notes of this podcast to examples of some performances of Infinite Flow, because I know you have some on your website, because mm -hmm. it, it's hard for me to describe what it's like again, because I don't think it I don't think most people are used to seeing disabled and non disabled dancers performing and, and creating art together. It's, it's incredible just watching everyone's, you know, the athleticism and the coordination and just the incredible moving beauty of all of these performances is just just something that you have to see to really understand. So I'll put some links in there and people can take a look after. Um, yeah, absolutely. Listen. And I think I think to add to that, what's interesting is that, and I'm sure you know this, is that, you know, our perceptions of people are really, really so much based on what we see in the media and on TV, film and media of all sorts, including books. And I'll, I'll just say that, you know, every single performance live or, you know, online that you see, like videos that you see, it's there to create that impact. When I ask the questions, what are the first three words that come to mind when you think about disability? Whether it's kids or adults, before seeing our performance or before seeing any of our content, usually these words are kind of negative words like sad, bad, tragic, injury, hospital. Like, I mean, it's, it's like that. Yet after they see a performance or one of our videos, the, the perceptions change, you know, so we're here to, you know, change those perceptions. But I think sometimes with disability advocacy or like this, like I will say the disability community and disability philanthropic work and nonprofits, the disabled person is sometimes put on the pedestal in a way too. But instead, I like to say, no, you know, disability is just a natural part of our humanity. And so within our work too, it's integrated with disabled and non-disabled people. And, you know, I know that we're going to transition into this topic, so I'm going to just mention it. 70 to 80% of disabled people have invisible disabilities. And one of the challenges that I'm facing right now is because the wheelchairs stand out in our work, how can we like highlight and make sure that the dancers with invisible disabilities are also equally highlighted as well? It's not uncommon for me to receive an email from some casting agency here in LA saying, hey, we're looking for disabled talent. And when they say disabled talent, they're not talking about people like me where you can't see the disability. Mm -hmm. They're looking for people, people with disabilities that have visible and obvious disabilities. And sometimes I get notices that say looking for disabled talent where their disabilities are visible. And to me, that's not quite representation either. So even with my dance company as well, I used to have this marketing rule of no photos go on to anywhere unless there's a wheelchair in that photo. And recently I'm like, you know, that rule has got to go out the door. Like that means that I am excluding my own self as an autistic person from this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I definitely want to talk about your, your recent discovery that you are autistic and just a, a bit of backstory when we first started talking to set up an interview i think you hadn't been diagnosed or discovered as autistic yet i just want to learn more about infinite flow and now i'm so interested to learn about your own journey to finding out that you're autistic as well and if it's kind of changed the way that you look back on your life and make sense of how everything has played out so like what happened to lead up to you discovering that you're autistic yeah so First of all, yes, it's very interesting. You and I connected like a couple years ago before the diagnosis, but then you had introduced yourself that you were also late diagnosed with autism. And I had remembered that it took a couple of years for me to like circle back. And in that meantime, you yeah, had diagnosed with autism. So how I even came to deciding to assess myself was that, you know, throughout the years of leading infinite flow, you know, as time went on, I started to learn about invisible disabilities and neurodiversity and mental illness and all, all of that. And I was diagnosed first with PTSD 
about two years ago, I would say. And I was actually relieved that all this trauma that I'm going through and all the triggers and all, you know, all of this was not something, there wasn't anything wrong with me. Let's, let's just, let's just start with that. So with neurodiversity, you know, I started learning more about neurodiversity and long story short, I felt called to diagnose a close family member. I, I can't reveal too much about this family member, but just in a long story short, this family member is someone that needed to be diagnosed when they were young and needed that support, yet didn't get that support. So I ended up getting this family member uh, assessed and he was diagnosed with autism. And along that journey, I learned more about autism. And I'm as I'm learning more about, you know, what autism is, I was feeling like I was checking a lot of boxes myself. And I started to wonder if I was autistic myself on the spectrum. And so then I decided to get assessed and I was diagnosed with autism. So I am autistic. I'm on the spectrum. I will say the diagnosis gave me more clarity than confusion. Yeah. And looking back on some of the experiences that you've had in your life, I mean, even as you've been talking and telling your story, knowing now that you're autistic, I think back like, oh, like when you were describing that you thought that if you could study to be a doctor for dancers, that that would kind of help you understand how to be a better dancer. I'm like, that kind of sounds very similar to why I studied psychology. So that I could understand <laughs> like all of human behavior and how does this work and how do I get to do this better? So even small things just, you know, with all that context. So, I mean, looking back, are there experiences that now realizing that you're autistic, have you had any insights since then? Yeah, there's a lot and I'm still unpacking a lot of this, but let me start with kind of the more obvious ones or more, I don't say obvious, but uh, noise sensitivity. Yeah. I tried tap dancing, I think when I was seven or eight, and I loved tap dancing. I absolutely loved it, you know. However, I had to quit after like four or five classes because the noise, the pounding, pounding sounds just gave me a headache and made me dizzy. And I finally just couldn't I just couldn't endure it that I, I, you know, that I quit, you know, yeah. noise sensitivity is something that I've had throughout my life. And most of the times I just kind of muscled my way through yet, you know, I would get cranky or I think in worst case scenario, someone's trying to talk to me yet. I can't quite hear that person's words and it's not processing. And so I think there's been times where someone got mad at me because I didn't listen to them, for example. Today, I've learned to advocate for myself where I can. So if a restaurant is noisy, I'll see if we can sit in a different place that's a little quieter. I'm learning more and more that, especially if I want to have a deep conversation with someone that I need to just make sure I do the research and meet in a place where we can have that conversation. I'll say a big thing about my diagnosis. The psychologist pointed out something that I did during high school that said, yeah, this is definitely going to check another box. And, and, you know, I've had a lot of social anxiety throughout my life. It's been very difficult for me to open up to others. And, you know, there's always a part of me that th thought that there's something wrong with me. You know, I think one incident that my psychologist said that really revealed my autism was when I was in high school, freshman year, and I was going to a public high school, a typical well, public high school in Irvine, California. And I didn't have many friends. I was very much into dancing and doing the ballet thing after school. So my friends were very, like, I only had a couple friends at school because I left school early. I didn't really hang out, did homework or joined the clubs or athletics. I was just there for like five classes and I was out. So one of my only friends betrayed me on a school group assignment and that pain was just so like so big and so hard on me and i i just couldn't take it you know to the point that i convinced my parents to let me homeschool 
I didn't know how to process the pain. My parents obviously, well, at that time, didn't know anything about mental health or getting counseling. I was a straight A student, honor student, AP student, always number one and number two in, in my class, you know, winning science fairs, all that. So the last thing that my parents thought was that, oh, Marissa needs help and Marissa has a disability. So anyways, but I convinced my parents. And so for my sophomore year, I homeschooled and I just wanted to get away from people. And I even created this belief in me that I don't need friends. I don't want friends. And if I have friends, it's just, they're just going to hurt me. You know, so that was when I was 14. It was actually when I was 24 and had the stroke and in the hospital, that was actually when I realized during the hospital, no one texted me, no one called me except for one college professor who I was close with at that time. And being at the hospital in that loneliness where, you know, seven weeks passed by without no one knowing that I had even had a stroke and was in the hospital, I realized that, no, this is not how I want to live my life of nobody knowing about me or caring about me. So I would say the stroke was also a turning point to just knowing that I actually wanted connection. I wanted community. And I would say that was a big kind of, oh, okay. That was part of my autism. I think the autism diagnosis kind of gave me permission to tell myself that there's nothing wrong with me, that this is just a part of me. And, and, and actually what I you know realized through the autism diagnosis that I actually like people. <laughs> I actually like being social. Am I still an introvert? Yes, but I still like being around people. So it was like last year in July that I was diagnosed with autism. And as the psychologist is kind of going through her observations, one of the things that she mentioned was about social cues, that I had some tendencies of missing social cues. And that kind of hit me hard, I won't lie, because, you know, I'm a sexual assault survivor times three, with the first one being a ballet teacher. And these sexual assaults had happened between the ages of 19 and 27. And, you know, later on, you know, I, I revealed to a close friend or then close friend about these sexual assaults for the first time to anyone. And the first thing that he said was, well, you tend to miss social cues and so probably these sexual assaults were your fault. You were probably just not picking up the cues. Oh my God. And I mean, this is like pre-autism diagnosis. And 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 I, you know, and this this was a guy that I was dating at that time. And obviously I'm not dating him anymore. Yeah, yeah. However, you know, like I think people have made fun of me for for missing social cues, or maybe they're laughing behind my back, you know? And and so, you know, I, you know, kind of got myself into wondering, well, had I been diagnosed with autism earlier in my life, would I have been able to prevent some of these sexual assaults? And was it really, maybe it was my fault, but, you know, once I got, went through that, that, that spiral, I had, I <laughs> definitely had, have had some conversations with friends and you know, life coaches that know this was not your fault. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, and so, yeah, so now it's like, I think I do miss social cues at times, but that just because I miss social cues doesn't mean that a sexual assault was my fault. And we're gonna erase that out of, <laughs> mm -hmm. erase that out of my, my thought process. So, yeah, so, the, but that's something that I think I had to emotionally process. And right now I, I just recognize that it might take some time to continue to process, but that's okay. One interesting thing is it's probably in the last like couple months that I've been kind of being a little bit more open about talking about my autism verbally, you know, hence I reached back out to you, you know, mm -hmm. and what's interesting is I think, you know, a lot of, especially my dancers and my dance companies sometimes laugh at me because I don't get jokes. 
I don't get jokes. I don't, I, and sometimes I don't understand idioms and I still don't understand a lot of idioms and kind of taking things literally. Yes. And I'm able to laugh at myself now. And, and before I would occasionally get hurt or feel like, like someone's just picking on me, but now it's like, I kind of laugh at it. And recently a friend of mine, a friend of mine that knows that I'm autistic, he texted me saying, Hey, I don't think you understood when I said X, Y, and Z, let me explain that to you. And, <laughs> and it was basically, I can't remember exactly what this phrase was, but it was a hyperbole that he had used. <laughs> and so I think he, he just read on my face that, Oh, Marissa just Marita's autistic brain just kind of like launched in that moment. And so I do appreciate when friends are kind of like, hey, let me just explain that to you. And I think with my closer friends, I am not afraid anymore to be like, hey, can you just explain what you mean by that? So that's been kind of nice, I'll say. That's good. Yeah, I really think that the people around you, especially as an autistic person, really just make a huge difference. Because as you said, it's not that we don't like people, you know, I think the vast majority of us would like to have good, healthy relationships and friendships and, and all of that. But yeah, it's really important to have the right people around you and not people who are going to blame you for things that are clearly not your fault at all, but people who really understand and just, you know, accept you for, for who you are. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it's a spectrum, you know, yeah. you and I don't come across as the stereotypical autistic people. Like, and I've, I've already gotten the, oh, you're autistic? You don't look autistic. I'm like, who said autism is supposed to look a certain way? And it's a spectrum. Therefore, you're going to find various types of, you're going to find diversity within the spectrum, you know? But, you know, at the same time, I think, and, and this sounds so, you know, as, as someone that's been a disability advocate since I created my dance company in 2015, you would think that it was easy for me to just come out and say, hey, I'm autistic. But it took me months to be able to do that in a way. And I mean, and that kind of reveals how much there is still so much stigma around neurodiversity and being autistic. And, you know, yet at the same time, it didn't make sense for me to hide that part of me as a disability advocate and as a leader. And to be very honest with you, I was actually more afraid of the disability community judging me than anyone else. And the reason why I say that is that for the last whatever years, I've been labeled as a non-disabled ally. And occasionally, I won't lie, I, I've been excluded out of some disability justice leadership circles because I'm not disabled, yet I'm leading an organization that promotes disability inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, now it's like I'm calling myself disabled. And you know, and I've already gotten that, well, did you get the assessment just to just to prove and just to get yourself an in into the disability leadership community? I said, no, I did this because I wanted to learn more about myself and all these effing challenges I've had <laughs> in my life. And as a result of the diagnosis, it's like, oh, that's what it that's what that was, you know, in the DSM-5, you know criteria they talk about restricted interests and and how a lot of people with autism once you're into something you're into something it's like to the extreme of doing that activity and i'm definitely that with dance i've been that with with various topics and various activities and i think that's a strength of autistic people of being able to dive into one topic for a long long period of time and go very deep into it. Now, is it only autistic people that go that far and deep? No, no, but it's definitely a trait. Um, and I think for me, I'm still learning about my autism. I'm, I'm more learning how to talk about my autism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in order to in order to kind of break the the stigma around this is that we got to start talking about it and I got to be okay. And I decided I'm going to be okay saying that I'm autistic from now on. And if people start judging me, then that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah. And all the more important to start really highlighting and, and including invisible disabilities like you started doing with Infinite Flow because there's so many people who they're not believed, they're not taken seriously because they don't quote unquote look disabled or look autistic. 
Yeah, Marissa, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about the type of speaking that you do or if they want to learn more about Infinite Flow? Absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I do have a Twitter and TikTok account as well. I'm not so active, but I'm planning to be a little bit more active. But you can find me at Marissa Hamamoto. For Infinite Flow, everything is Infinite Flow Dance. And same thing with the websites, marissahamamoto.com, infiniteflowdance.org. Definitely subscribe to my newsletters, both at marissahamamoto.com and infiniteflowdance.org. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll put those links in the show notes so people can see the website, watch clips of the dances, subscribe to your newsletter, and get in touch with you there. And as we close out, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know or anything that they can help or support you with? I just wanted to say that no matter who you are, there is nothing wrong with you. <laughs> if you're going through a journey of kind of self-discovery, or maybe you're wondering if you're autistic, ADHD, neurodivergent, um, I mean, if you're kind of going through this, am I this or am I that, just know that there is nothing wrong with you. You don't get diagnosed with one of those either. You don't fit the box of any of these diagnoses either. There's nothing wrong with you. No matter who you are, there is a path that is right for you, that is unique for you. So keep keep kind of searching for that path. And I think if there's anything that I have learned along my journey that can sum it up is that, you know, we can turn our limitations into limitless possibilities. When uh, no hits the door and challenges hit the door, those are sources to create and innovate. And no matter what the situation is, you know, finding a way is part of the way. And there's a lot of beautiful things that can come from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you so much for being on my podcast. I really enjoyed talking with you and I'm so glad that we got to connect and thank you for sharing your story on my show. I really appreciate it. No, thank you, Carolyn. I I, I really appreciate it. And just, you know, amazing podcast and congratulations on your recent award, you know, too. Thank you so much.